continue on with class number 12, I'm going to take a little uh, side trip here and talk about uh, engines. All right. Um, so I don't want to go through the entire spiel that I would. I usually take class one uh, in other semesters where we start to take a look, look closely at different engine parts. Um, but some things that you want to know uh, about engines that you might have uh, uh, run across in thermodynamics or maybe uh, in thermo 2, maybe, I don't know. Uh, um, man, let's just take a look at a couple pictures of engines for the hell of it and then I'll get to the point of this. All right, so uh, here's like a, a, a really big engines that I have been on, on, on ships that I have worked on. Um, a man BMW. Uh, this is called a slow speed uh, engine because they, they only turn about 100 RPM right around there. Somewhere between 90 and 120 RPM is typical for a slow speed. So you, you don't need a reduction gear. You can uh, be directly uh, attached to the propeller off of the output of this. That's how slow these engines go. Um, but they're huge, right? So you can see the size of this man uh, right here. But And they're uh, two stroke, which uh, means that like for uh, every revolution, um, there is a power stroke uh, that's taking place as opposed to a four stroke right here. So uh, here's, no, I like these little animations right here, and I wish they'd make a higher quality. Here's like my, uh, my good friend from college, uh, Brian, uh, standing next to, uh, as they're removing the uh, piston out of uh, one, of the, one of the big slow speed engines on here. And you can see, the, here's, a, here's one very similar to a ship I was on as a cadet, um, where we had five cylinders. Uh, this is a Solzer engine. Um, and uh, I think it was a Solzer, I think it was a 76, an RTA 76, and 76 centimeters would be the bore of the, uh, of the cylinders. That's, that's pretty big. You could stand inside the thing. Um, you could see the size of the, the piston is pretty, pretty big. You could, look, you could see that dude right there, because you could see this big uh, Solzer. This is a 96, so this is even bigger, right? It has a 96 centimeter bore onto uh, the thing. It's, that's a, that's a, thousands of tens of thousands of horsepower like the one I was on that was like a 15,000 horsepower and uh, it only had five cylinders um, but you know I'm talking about the parts of the block and the piston and the connecting rod and these different bearings and that kind of thing right here is it here's the crankshaft and a flywheel and um, it's all the kind of all oh, the head right here we can see all the valves and the intake valves and the exhaust valves and could learn about them and it had the springs was one of the things that we had in there and we also cams uh, and rocker arms to be able to open up them and close the valves for the engine timing one of the important things and, and this is where it becomes relevant to the uh, to the bearings is that we have an intake uh, a stroke where uh, the valves open intake valves open up and the pistons going down and uh, air or maybe an air fuel ratio uh, mixture which uh, happens in, in uh, carbureted uh, cars and fuel injected cars I guess again cars right gasoline engines um, diesel engines have uh, have a uh, um, I think yeah, yeah it's, it's got to be true every every diesel engine has uh, fuel injectors directly into the uh, cylinder right, right into the cylinder whereas cars that are fuel injected are actually are just injecting fuel into the, uh, the manifold right and so instead of having a carburetor they inject it but anyway yeah you can have a fuel air mixture coming in here um, and during the intake stroke as the pistons going down we call that the suck um, uh, one here and then we uh, the pistons close and the uh, uh, excuse me the valves close and the piston goes up and this is the compression right so, so that's the squeeze uh, um, part of the cycle, part of the stroke of the cycle, I should say. And uh, then it, uh, as it gets, the piston gets to the top, there's a spark, it ignites, kaboom, and now it forces the uh, piston back down, right? That's where the power stroke, right? That's where we're actually getting power out of the thing. And then um, the valves, when it gets to the bottom, uh, the exhaust valve opens up, and now the piston starts moving upwards and helps and push, expels the um, combusted, uh, used up uh, uh, fuel and air, uh, the exhaust stroke right there, right? So uh, we call that might be the blow, right? So this is the suck, squeeze, bang, blow is the uh, four stroke uh, cycle, right? And it, it actually takes two revolutions for every uh, cycle. So for every power, there, there's one, one half, well actually it's just one half of 
one of the strokes is where the power comes out and the other three aren't, aren't u really useful strokes, right? They, in fact, even the compression takes energy out. So uh, it's a, uh, uh, here, here's, here's another animation of the thing right here. So we can, it's kind of cool right there, where we go. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow, right? As we come through there. I like that animation. So, um, and then thermodynamically, we can see that it creates what is referred to as a banana curve, where we have the pressure versus volume right here. And you could see here is the, um, the squeeze, here is the bang, down here, and here's the blow, right? So actually, there's, the, it, there's an extra little thing um, for a four stroke, uh, where you have like a little, a little guy down here where you have, so here is the suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow, right there, uh, onto the thing. And the area underneath this uh, represents work, right? But there's also work right here to be able to, there's work expelled, uh, put into the thing, right? So it, it costs you some uh, to be able to uh, go, no, no, I guess maybe I should say that wrong right here. Here's the squeeze, is, that's the area underneath it. Anyway. The area over here is the network. Um, I don't know what the purpose of this one was, but maybe just I liked it. I don't know. And I like the two-stroke one where you can see that it's uh, for every road revolution there is a power stroke, right? So there, it, it combines the uh, intake and exhaust with the uh, the compression and the power right there. So um, terminology parts of our little engine right here, estimate here. So here I go through the thermodynamics. Um, usually I just do a little hand waving and people just kind of go Whoa. But the point of it is, is that we can go figure out this banana curve uh, by way of these uh, processes and isentropic processes um, right here. So, and, and this is really just one half of the, uh, this is just one cycle around. I didn't bother with that lower uh, intake and exhaust. We'll just pretend that those are uh, small enough that they don't, they're inconsequential. But if you now, instead for this volume, instead that you don't have the angle, right? So now we have the amount of, um, you can think of it, you know, we were kind of stretching the banana curve out. So we could figure out at any particular uh, uh, rotational position of the piston, we could figure out what the pressure is going to be on the top uh, of the piston. And we can use that uh, pressure times the area of the piston and think of that as the force. And we can also um, go backwards and figure out uh, from that force what the torque is going to be. And now we can get kind of sort of like um, an idea of what the fluctuating torque is going to be in our engine. And we can also, um, from that force uh, that's being placed onto the thing, we can also figure out what the bearings have to face. So the bearings are going to have um, repeated uh, uh, loads, right? And uh, so it's not a constant load that's on these bearings. So they're going to have to um, keep facing a, uh, a force and then force and then force and so the force isn't constant though it isn't like an on off force it's a gradually changing force and this right here is the representation of what that force is going to be like um, so uh, I, I even worked it out so now we have like what the torque curve is going to be that's with that MD um, but we also have the uh, let's see from this I believe uh, we're going to have the uh, the radial force uh, uh, at maximum torque and the tangential right there, right? So uh, the radial one right here is the one that's going to be felt by that bearing. So that FR uh, uh, that we're looking at right here. See that green guy? He's the, he, he, he is the, uh, so you see what the total force is going to be. That's the one that's at the top of the piston, but I've separated it out into tangential and radial. And the radial is the one that's going to be felt by the bearing. So, um, coming back to what uh, I'm using this for, is now we could try to figure out, do an estimation using the techniques that we've described in uh, class, or in this class, in class 12, uh, to try to figure out, um, maybe estimate the life of this bearing. 
Um, for our engine, we want to estimate the life at full load speed if one compression and power cycle is approximated by the graph below. Uh, we also know uh, what the RPM of this engine would be, and this is going to be at full power. So we're just going to say, like, when is the bearing going to fail? And I think this is like an interesting um, way to approve. Uh, and we might, we could even like say with a particular reliability if we wanted to. So let me see. Come back to uh, here where we're trying to uh, to do this. So um, what I say uh, we should do is to uh, break this thing down into like little rectangles, right? So I gave uh, we we could I'm gonna just call it right here and. I think I decided it, it, it kind of you could decide that you want to put over to here or over to there but I decide I gave you these right here so we're gonna pretend that it has this loading right there for all that time and then um, I gave you this number right here so we'll pretend it has this loading for all of this amount of that cycle and then the same thing for right here I guess so I'm just picking them by, by you know, this this point, I got to use one of these as the base onto the thing. You know, I could have drawn these rectangles onto the other side if I wanted to, but I gave you these numbers, so we'll put, we'll put them right there. So, so here's the rectangles uh, that we would have, right? Um, we'll assume this one is zero, and we'll assume this is zero. But remember, this goes on for 720 um, uh, uh, degrees, right? That, that that because this is this is during the the power stroke. So um, I would I would use Excel um, f for uh, this uh, most of the time. Let's see one here. Uh, let me pause. Okay, so I'm looking at uh, two different sources right here for the same thing. Yeah. Okay, I got the same answer. All right. Um, so what I might want to do is make like a nice table out of this. Um, I want to use the angles right that have been done here so if we take a look right here this right here between here and here is 30 degrees and between here 160 and 120 that looks like it's about 60 degrees and 180 here is 30 degrees and between here and here right that's uh, another 30 degrees right and then between this and this looks like there's another 60 degrees and uh, did I use this next one? I think I did. Yeah, 310 to 360. So here's another uh, 50 degrees here, right? So um, I decided to call these intervals 1, 2, uh, 3, 4, and 5, and 6 right here. So I will have in my uh, little table that I'll make up onto the thing. six of these intervals right here. So there's, here's one, two, three, four, five. Did I make enough? I don't know. Let me see here. I'll go one, two, three, four, five. One more. Six. And um, here, uh, I'm gonna write, uh, um, here's my delta theta right here, right? So I said that there was gonna be 30 degrees, um, 60 degrees, 30 degrees, um, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, and 50 degrees. And now I'll take my uh, uh, fraction. So that's gonna be just 30 divided by 720 now, okay? Now, you know, it's, it's, I'm saying there's nothing that happens right here. This is my approximating thing, and there's nothing that takes place over there. So uh, that's going to come out to 0 0.04167. I'm going to add uh, similarly here, 720. We'll get, of course, twice that, 8333. Three, three. Um, so this points 0 0.04167, 167. 0, 8, 3, 3, 3, 3, whatever. And then uh, 50 over 720, right? So we get uh, 0 0.06944.
right here. So here's the load uh, that we would have at each of these, right? So we find out that we have in terms, and these are pounds. Yes, they're pounds. Uh, so we have 182, we have 589, we have 2807, we have 1545, and then we have uh, 599, whoops, and then 183. So let's take the fraction, right? So we're going to go load to the third times the fraction, right? And you don't have to write out all of these. 190, this is, let's see, we have 17 million, 28, there you go. Uh, 1 billion, 228,000. 700, I think, 700,000, that's a lot, uh, 153,600,000, uh, 17,000,000, and then uh, 425,000. So some of them don't even matter all that much, right? So we take the summation of all of those, and I get 1,418,000,000 blah 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 and now I take um, I can find my equivalent by taking uh, that to the one-third and I find that I get a 1,123 now you can almost like kinda like kinda eyeball where that would be like somewhere somewhere in there but it did, it did wait for the amount of the thing, right? So it, it isn't necessarily exactly like this average. It's, it's weighted based on this third onto the thing, right? Um, but this is, uh, so now what we would do to try to find a bearing or to find the life of the thing, we take a look and um, we use this C10. And now I want to make sure we have the application factor in there. I wrote this over here. I had my uh, the life I called D, LD over LR whoop, raised to the one over A onto the thing. I look up this bearing and I find that this bearing has a um, a rate a C10 of 14.00 kilonewtons. And by the way, I turned this into uh, um, kilonewtons as well. 4.997 kilonewtons is what I'm saying that this bearing uh, or this, this load is going to be. Right? So here's what the rated one is. And uh, so, um, and I say that I decide that I'm going to pick an application factor of 1.5. Like, how did I decide of an application of 1.5? Well, I looked up at table 11.5 in the book, and let's see, machinery with light impact, with moderate impact, and it's 1.5 here, 1.5 here, 1.5, I don't know, we're, we're making an estimation right here, we're trying to see, how can we, uh, we, we want to figure out how long this better, uh, um, this, uh, bearing is going to live. Um, so I stick this back. I stick put it in here. I say 14 equals 1.5. Here's my 4.997. I take my LD and my 1 million. 1 over 3. I get LD was going to be equal to 6.515 E6 revs. So 6,515,000 revs. Um, I figure out my life is going to be um, LD over 60 in my RPM. This RPM, um, now we have to be careful here. This is going to be, um, do we do it? Yeah, this is every other revolution this happens so we want to use half the rpms right if you had to use like the logic to try to figure out like okay so is it going to be is it loaded every uh, is it, is this thing loaded um every rpm no a load cycle is two 
revolutions right here. So you have to be, you, so this is a uh, full power. We're trying to figure out the life at full power, 3,600 RPM. So we actually use 1,800 or 18 for this RPM. So um, 6.515 E6 divided by 60 divided by 1,800 RPM. And so what we're left with is uh, 60.33 hours. And let's figure out how many days that's going to be. That's 2.51 days. Interesting. Okay. Um, and uh, I also asked someone to look up in the, in the catalog to try to find a replacement uh, for this bearing um, if we wanted it to last longer. And uh, I think I was only able to find one that could make uh, that, that met all these criteria for the, these dimensions. So that's a, a real world example. Trying to look up here. Uh, let me see. I'll grab that bearing here uh, and actually take a look at it here for a second. I'm still here, so let me um, pause this one more second. So here is the bearing uh, that we're talking about, the actual thing, and we can look up really closely onto this. We can see that it says C and U TM6205, right? So um, we can look this up online, can't we? So let me, uh, let me find it. I'll pause to find it. You don't need to see me Googling. Okay, so I found a um, bearing. Uh, this is a, this is not our bearing. I, I, I know I Googled this before, but I can't find the C and U uh, thing. But I have found it before, um, like available on Amazon, but it wasn't this time. That's kind of a sort of a surprise. I did find uh, this problem was on Chegg, though. Right, that some, somebody uh, took my uh, thing right here, but nobody answered it. I'm gonna get like. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to do my other right here. This is my problem. Please take it off your website. Edeal at hartford.edu. Report. <laughs> oh, but anyway, um, yes. Uh, um, here, here's the bearing. By the way, $26 for this bearing. Are you kidding me? For this thing, this engine has two of them in there, and it cost me ninety-seven dollars. But anyway, um, no one's gonna watch this video. 